Come on, Fountain of Life Church. Give Jesus a, a glorious praise. Hallelujah. My God, I love this church. Uh, yesterday, I had, uh, last night, uh, Pastor Jimmy began to show me your Easter production. I was blown away. I'm like, I can watch this on Broadway in New York. It was that good. And I prophesy, I, I, I want to work with you, man of God. You know, come on, somebody. Amen. I, I can't act, but I can do some things in America. <laughs> so I want to see how I can help Pastor Jimmy with certain things. I'm so love him and Pastor Tolu. Put hands together for them. Just, uh, just, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You can take your seats just for a few seconds before we read the first scripture. Tonight, you're going to be heading for my bishop. Uh, bishop to the Bismarck is a dear friend and uh, my bishop I'm, I'm part of the African Council of Apostles by the by the special grace of God and I wrote a book on the battle of altar spiritual encounter te spiritual technology for divine encounters that he autographed and the man that's coming I believe this week my friend Joshua Selman he told me that it is one of the best teaching on altars he told me himself, he said, to the we have some of the best teaching on altars of any man I know in the earth today. And that's saying a lot coming from Joshua, Apostle Joshua. So I'm looking forward to seeing him. I hear that he's on the wrist of people coming. I wrote a book called The Joseph of Arimathea Calling, about the a calling, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, I'm going to raise kingdom paymasters in the last days who can pay the bills of the kingdom. And he said to me, one of the, one of the anointings of the last days is a masterful anointing in business. And the Lord said to me that the business anointing is going to be elevated, elevated as it was in the beginning, so shall it be at the end. He was a businessman called Joseph of Arimathea who rescued the body of Jesus from the hand, from the hand of Pontius Pilate after Jesus was dead. You know, you have no understanding how big that was that Jesus Christ be rescued because he, he, he was condemned a Roman prisoner. So as a matter of fact, as far as Rome was concerned, he was a, he was a property of Rome. That's why, so that's why Pontius Pilate did everything he could not to, crucify, not to take over the trial. Because the moment he took over the trial, it became a legal official trial of Rome. And Roman law applied and Jewish law was suspended immediately. So God needed a masterful negotiator who can negotiate, who can negotiate the body of Jesus out of the hands of Rome. And he didn't use an apostle or a prophet who can prophesy. He used a man who can write a check. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. He's a very powerful teaching for business people. He will let you look at the wealth discussion from a whole different angle. See, there are realms of dominion where you don't need, where the anointing you need is not praying in tongues, it's writing checks. And uh, I'm beginning to come into that realm in America because... I mean, you know, even now they were, you know, when you become a donor, okay, I'm, you know, listen, I'm a Republican in America, but, uh, but, I'm, but now we are entering the donor class. So sometimes when you're a donor class and they know you can write some checks, you'll be amazed where they invite you. And I believe God wants to raise Adam and Thiers in Nigeria. Talk to me, somebody, that when the church is in trouble as a matter of political policy, We've got Aramathias who can go behind the veil and politicians can listen to them and things change. I don't know behind the curtains that one of us went there and did something that changed everything. That is the teaching on Joseph of Aramathia. Tithes of honor is tithing under the order of Melchizedek. One of the reasons why tithing is such a controversial subject should not be is because most people that teach it have no understanding of the Melchizedek order and priesthood. Tithing does not begin with Levi, it begins with Melchizedek. And uh, it was given to Abraham after he had a lot of money, not before. Which means tithing, the essence of tithing is not to give you money. It's to protect you from what, it, what money brings into people's lives once they have it. Issuing divine restraining orders from the courts of heaven is a very powerful teaching on the judicial side of the kingdom. I, I'm a, as you know, I'm a man who's all things apple. I'm, I'm an apple guy. I love you know, recently I lost my iPod. So I, was, I went to a hotel, and I, I, I went to a hotel in Zambia. It's a, you know, it's a nice hotel. But I went to have breakfast, and I forgot my very expensive iPods. And somebody, one of the hotel workers, felt like the Lord was blessing them that morning. <laughs> so they took my iPods, you know, and five hours, five hours later, I remembered I couldn't find them. But thank God, I didn't buy a Samsung. It's Apple. So, listen. <laughs> 
He listened, Samsung is stealable, not Apple. So I took my phone. I told my son, come here. I've lost my Apple. But uh, whosoever took my nice iPod doesn't know Apple technology. So I went to my find, my, find my, my iPods. And, I, 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 and a miracle happened. My, my, my iPods were walking all over Zambia. I said, that's prophetic. So I took my, gave my son, and one of my sons is the head of the police in Zambia. He got off, and together they went. They found a the guy. They found a the guy, and they told him, he said, the hour, are you the ones with the iPods? No, 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 no. What are you talking about? And so my son, I told him what to do. He opened up the app, and he made them sing. Ding, 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 ding. And I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I mean, the man was on the floor. Please don't get my job. I don't know. I said, don't fire him. And he's already, don't, please don't. I don't want, I just wanted my iPods, you know. I said, but I tell him that compliments of iPod technology, okay? <laughs> but anyway, I, I was watching an article. I, I had, a, there was an article I saw in, um, this, I, there was this article that I saw uh, in America. I'm reading, and it was about Apple was suing Samsung because one of their phones uh, Samsung produced was so like the I, iPhone that, I, that Apple, comp, Apple uh, in California was convinced this was the reverse engineering of their technology. It became a massive case. So now I'm reading the article, and the article goes like this. In the article, the, a Californian female judge who was presiding over the case issued a temporary restraining order on Samsung for the global sales of this particular iPhone under question. And she said, I'm putting a temporary restraining order on this, Samsung must withdraw all sales, freeze all sales of this product. Now remember, at the time, Samsung had sold millions of that particular phone. And I'm reading the article, and the article goes like this, that Samsung headquarters made a communication with all their branches all over the world to pull that phone until the lawyer, had, until the judge had adjudicated the case. And as I'm looking at that, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I didn't even know God was reading the newspaper with me. He kind of ambushed me on this thing. He said to me, did you see that? I said, what are you talking about? He said, what you just read? He said, yeah. He said to me, he said to me, here is a female judge in California without breaking a sweat from the power of a judicial office. She writes an order that is globally obeyed by a multi-billion dollar corporation. They are making money, but in spite of the fact they are making money, they, does not, they don't rebel. The entire corporation of Samsung globally responded to the restraining order. And God said to me, and yet my people don't come to me for divine restraining orders. Am I not a judge? That was the beginning of an oracle that would change the world. My book became number 100 on Amazon for two weeks, unheard of in Christendom in America. It got number 100 on Amazon. That is, that's a space for, John, for Dan Brown, John Grisham. Very rarely do you find a Christian book making the Amazon 100. Why? Because the algorithm is ruthless. It ranks your book every hour because they are trying to make money. You know, and Amazon has millions of titles. My book got to number 100 next to John Grisham and Dan Brown. That one on restraining orders. It's one of the most, I mean, it exploded so much sales. But what I love about it more than anything else is the miracles people are getting from applying the revelation. To me, I believe in the theology of practice. Amen. We can talk about things, but when you can demonstrate, it's even better. I speak to the earth release prosperity is a book I wrote when witches in Zambia tried to kill me using dirt. And the Lord used what the enemy meant for evil to show me that the earth is not dead. She is alive and can be spoken to. You know, and you'll be amazed what the Bible has to say about the earth. It's how dynamic the earth is. Ever since I wrote that book, uh, Sid Roth actually asked me to do a television show on it because there were so many miracles connected to this revelation alone. People couldn't have property getting property. People lost their property getting it back. People lost titles, titles appearing supernaturally. It's amazing. You know, get the book. It will be a blessing to you. I have a teaching on it on YouTube. Maybe you can look for Francis Miles on YouTube. You might be surprised what you find. Amen. By clicking, by simply clicking to subscribe, it costs you nothing, but it can change everything. Following the footsteps of Rabbi Jesus is, became my final thesis on the courts of heaven. Because the one who introduced the courts of heaven in the New Testament theology was Jesus. Nobody ever talked about the courts of heaven in the New Testament theology until Jesus came. It was, it's everywhere, plus that in the Old Covenant, Daniel talks about it. You know, Zechariah talks about it. You know, so many portions of, of, the, of the Tanakh speak about the courts of heaven. That God has a real place where judicial activity and verdicts are rendered that affect the course of people and nations. 
And as a matter of fact, the judicial system of the earth is templated, is a shadow of the higher priesthood, is a, is a, is a shadow of the higher court system that is in heaven. As a matter of fact, if that court rules, there's no court on earth that can overrule. Because it's about, it's about superiorness. In America, for instance, the, the nine justices is where it ends in America. If once they saw those nine justices say it is what it is, no matter if you like it, it ends all debate. Can I tell you that the courts of heaven is the supreme court over every judicial system known to man? You know, and so we have actually changed the verdicts that were made in American court systems by taking people to the courts of heaven. You know, it's amazing. My book, The Order of Mechizek, I've produced over 6,000 students out of this a curriculum, I, I built a school on the order of Melchizedek. Because I really believe that how it began is how it's going to end. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. You know, the first priesthood known to man, revealed to man, was revealed to Abraham. It was Melchizedek. It was a priesthood where a man can be both king and priest in the same station. That is the order of priesthood. But, in, uh, but once you get down to Moses, because the people are so hard-headed, God had to break down what was integrated as a technology in Melchizedek becomes broken down in Israel. So now you have kings on one side, you have God priests on one side. Anytime you have humanity on different sides of the pendulum, they're going to begin to divide what God has already united. So now you find the priesthood among the Levites, you find the kingship among the kings, but not, nothing was ever really connected. And you see political fight, fights between the kings and the priests. It's not what God intended. Because in the order of Melchizedek, we are both. We are kings and priests. You know, I can prophesy, I can teach, but at the same time, baby, I can do business like the best of them. Okay? Amen? Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen. All right. Turn, let's turn up for the reading of God's word. These books are here uh, because I'm going to be here because I just want to enjoy the conference. You know, thank you for Pastor Jimmy is letting me stay long. Amen. Hallelujah. Just pray that I don't stay, my, I don't overstay my welcome. Amen. There's always a, you know, come on, somebody. Amen. But um, uh, because I'm going to be here, I just want to enjoy Bishop tonight. Uh, I mean, it's so good today. You know, uh, this, is my, this is my most exciting service. You know why? Because after today, I'm going to be lazy like everybody here. <laughs> Amen. Because I'm done, okay? I'm just going to be here just enjoying everybody, just you mean, shouting with you guys. It's going to be good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, I want everybody to turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11 to 13. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse uh, 13 to 11. And I'm going to be using your new King James Version. Amen. By the Spirit of the Lord, we're going to read it together as loudly as we can. And then you can take your seat. What I'm going to bring, present this morning, I can tell you it's going to really bless you. It's going to bless you because it's about, it's going to really challenge you in, in your, how you walk with God. I think, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a, this is really a teaching about how men, how God works with men. You know, uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11 to 13. Are you ready? Okay, after count of three, let's read it together as loudly as you can. One, two, three, read. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well. I am ready to perform my word. Verse 13. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot and it's facing away from the north. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Now turn to your neighbor and say, What do you see? And ask them again. I mean, say, Really, what do you see? It's very interesting, amen, that that's what God would ask a man, Jeremiah, be at the embassy, at the infancy of his ministry. It would seem to me that the divine is more concerned not about a person's theology as much as what they can see. Because you can always clean up theology, but what I found in working with God, it's very difficult sometimes to change what people see. No matter what you say to people, if they don't see themselves successful, success is not going to come no matter how anointed you are. Tell your neighbor, what do you say? Tell them, as you see the word of explosion, what do you say? Where do you see? Tell them, now, where do you see your life going? Two, three years. Five years. Father, I thank you for the anointing. I thank you for the mystery, for the revelation. This is a beautiful, I sense the cool breeze. 
the work of God is so beautiful this morning. So I know, Father, let your wind, the soft, gentle blow of the wind of the Spirit, guide the teaching deeper into our spirit. Because those tonight to this morning, it's going to feel like we are at an, we're in the desert at an oasis drinking cool, fresh water. In Jesus' name. And beginning to now allow you to get into spaces we have not understood or allow you to get into so you can lift us. For you are a God who lifts men. Lift our heads. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your seats. You know, when I was studying, uh, the, I have been, what I'm going to invite you into this morning is a conversation I've been having with God because the older I get, the more I become concerned about time. The currency of time becomes very important because you begin to realize that destiny is played against the calendar of time. And you want to make sure that whatever it takes for God to use you, if it can take three months, don't make it take three years. Is that right? Because so much can happen with God if you can get, if you can quickly align with God's will of doing things. Because the reality about God is He's not going to bend to how you do it. He expects you absolutely as a sovereign and having foreknowledge he wants you to bend to his way of saying things. He may empathize with your experiences that could be traumatic, could be, that could explain your hesitancy in responding to the divine. But when it's said and done, you must bow. If you want God to be the one that uses you and do something powerful in your life. You know, so I've given myself a study to, you know, in scripture, one of my, one of my Studies I've given myself to is why men rise and others do not, do not rise within the same house. That it will be God speaking the same thing to everybody. And then you come back a year or two later, some people have risen to pinnacles of success, you know, that are glorious. And the people that were in the same conference are actually gone back further. They have retrogressed further. And so I've studied this issue because above everything else, Knowing what I'm coming from. Amen. I want to be used by God more than anything else. And I realize that there's a calendar I'm working against. You know, in the NFL or any, any, any NFL, if, if in, the, in the NFL, when you hit the two-minute mark in the game, the intensity of the game explodes. The reason it explodes because talent at that moment doesn't mean anything but the clock. And so teams begin to manage the clock. If you are behind, you know, then you have to really change. You can't play it safe anymore because you have already hit the two-minute mark. And I'm telling you the most amazing thing, that in the NFL, the last two minutes are the fastest, fastest minute. It's like when you're watching the whole game, there, you, you have got, but the last, is there something about the last two minutes? The intensity rises. And you say, whatever I didn't get right, it doesn't matter, you know. And most uh, um, championship coaches, they, 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 have a, they have a grid they work from. Once a two-minute mark, even the best quarterbacks like Tom Brady was known. He was an assassin when the two minutes. See, it's amazing what time, losing time. Uh, time is working against you, that's for certain people. For some people, he paralyzes them. For some people, their senses become heightened. They've got to win this thing. So whatever mistakes I've made yesterday, I've got to fix it because at the end of the day, I'm going to have a W behind my name. You know, so I, I've, been, I've really spent time looking at these issues in life. Amen. And I don't think you are here at Word of Explosion this morning when others are working. They will join us tonight. You know, just because you have no other place to be. I think some of you took time off, do all kind of things. So I want to make this morning meaningful. Can I do that? So, uh, I'm, I'm, always cons I'm, always, uh, I'm always very careful to uh, take very seriously the questions that come from the mouth of the divine. Because God, um, God is all answers. So, when he's asking a question, it's not because he needs to know himself. 
It is because questions are the quickest way to locate the student and help align them quickly so they don't waste their time. So God, as he talks to young Jeremiah, the first thing he tells them, what do you see? You know, God is like, I'm not even going to care about your theology because I can always deal with that later. Right now, what do you see? Because what you see will determine, will tell me how long it's going to take for me to raise you as a voice to your generation. Because the truth of the matter is, this is what separates men and women in the house of God. Is what do you see? What do you see? So I'm going to work with this uh, over several uh, scriptures. And I'm telling you to be very meaningful. You know, very rarely am I, am I uh, betwixt between two titles. Um, you know, but right now, I'm really struggling because even though I've given you the title, what do you see? There's another title that is competing for the same message. So I'm just going to give you both. And hopefully at the end we can connive, we can synchronize the two titles. Is that okay? So the second title I was thinking for this message is the curse, the curse of the curious case of our physical eyes. Say with me, the curse. Now when I say the curse, it's, uh, it's just because of my pronunciation, it's C-R-C-U-R-A. C -R -C -U -R -A. Is it right? C-U-R-A-S-E. That's it. The curse of the curious case. Now, the second curse is C-A-A-S-E. Does that make sense? The curse of the curious case of our physical eyes. So, God says to Jeremiah, what do you see? And when Jeremiah tells him what he sees, and God finds that what the man is seeing and what the divine is seeing are synchronized, God says, oh, then you have seen well. Because if you can see what I'm seeing, then you have seen, well, now I can hasten my word into performance. Meaning that seeing clearly, seeing what God is seeing, actually hastens divine performance. So when there's lack of divine performance in human life, I can always ask you the first question, you know, because I do, I do spiritual and business consulting. The first thing is, what are you seeing? Because if, you're not, if, if, if there's no divine performance, God is telling, God in this passage is tying, attaching divine performance to the sea, to the seeing of a man of God. If you can't see what I'm seeing, then I'm going to stay on the same place, begin to work with you until I can get you to a place where you are seeing what I'm seeing. Because until then, there'll be no divine performance. It, the question of what do you see is so important to God, he asks it a second time. Always notice whenever God repeats himself. The principle at hand is an, is an immutable and negotiable principle of how spirits move. He asked him again, what do you see? And the boy twice passed the test. I see, the boil, I see a boiling, I see a boiling pot. You know, I see a boiling pot. You know, and God again says, you have seen well. I've seen a boiling pot. It's facing from the well, uh, from, from, the, from the north. When God is now convinced that this man has eyes of the spirit to say what the divine can say, God knows this journey is going to be fast. It's going to be fast because the reason there are, different there are different levels of speed in divine activity in people's lives is because of this issue. For some people, it doesn't take a lot for God to make them see, you know, what he wants them to see. For some people, it takes 10 years of teaching, you know, finagling before they finally see it. By the time they see it, somebody has had 10 years of speed. Because he's been seeing, it doesn't take a lot. And so I want to pray. I want to pray. To, I'm, I'm asking for the Lord to help you. So that, you know, your vision. Today, everybody's going to get a vision check from the Holy Spirit. And a vision adjustment. Amen? So with that as a background, we now move on to a, a, a mystery that I've only become to understand. You know, it's Genesis 3. You know, that the fall of man has a, had a lot to do with a, as the fall of man had a lot to do with sight as much as it had to do with the eating of the forbidden tree. As a matter of fact, now I'm now convinced that the only reason Satan wanted them to eat of the forbidden tree is because it was after their sight. And you're going to see something very interesting here. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Come on somebody, amen? amen. Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we begin from verse 1 because now, remember this guy, these two people, Adam and Eve, are living in an Edenic economy. 
They needed for nothing. They lived in the glory. I mean, I mean, God came to visit them every day in the cool of the evening. In the Ruach. The Bible says the Ruach. I mean, the breath of God would come. It was a cool breeze. I would come in there of God's presence every day. That's what they hosted. Now here comes, here comes Shatan, Satan, and here's what happens. Now the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field, which the Lord God had made. Now notice that the serpent was a... Was a well, it was a creature made by God, okay? And this is, you, in other words, Satan didn't make the snake. Today, when we are, today we have a reference. Today, because of the fall of Adam and the association of the fall of man with the snake, the snake has just have a bad, has a bad branding, okay? But there was a time when the snake was an asset within the economy of glory. Talk to me, somebody. <laughs> Satan did not make the snake. So if divine foreknowledge... If divine genius makes the snake, then the snake is supposed to be part of the economy of glory. As a matter of fact, Jesus in redemption, telling you because he's a redeemer, he redeems all things, right? Jesus redeems all things, including the snake. That's why he said to you, be as wise as what? Serpent. There was something the serpent was given that is needed for your generation. If you don't have what the snake was given as a gift... <laughs> you are going to be eaten and you'll be on the menu of the, you're gonna, you'll be on the menu of the power brokers of your day if you don't, if you are not as shrewd as a serpent. And then in your heart be harmless as a dove, but on the external, the exterior, when you are in that boardroom, you are in that government, whatever, talk to me, nobody likes you, everybody wants to eat your lunch. Talk to me somebody. They don't care that you're going to go end up on Facebook crying, how can you do this to me? Why are you saying, how can you do this to me? They are moving to the next deal floor. And you just become the menu of the, the last deal because you are so naive. Christians are so naive in the table in business. One of the things I do, and I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to help Christians in business, is, 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 is allow God to destroy this naivety, this Christian naivety. Because Jesus never taught us to appear in business like a, he said, in your heart be as harmless as a dove, but your exterior has to be of a snake. It has to be. The, so what, the snake was given a cunningness, a shrewdness. Why would the Satan, understand, Satan was looking for a tactical advantage against Eve and Adam. He wanted to change a dynamic within the ecosystem of their connection to God. And so coming in the garden, he was at a, dis he was at a disadvantage. And you're going to see why. You know, that the reason he was, at a, he was at a disadvantage was because of the kind of eyes God gave them. You know, God gave them. You know, talk to me somebody. You see, God promised them, you know, God has, I mean, I mean God has integrity. Is that right? Integrity means if I say something, I'm going to do exactly what I said. You know, God said, let us make man. Is that right? After our image, after our likeness. Is that right? You know, he said, let us make man. Okay? After our image, after our likeness. Okay? So the question that you have to ask ourselves, is God blind? If God is not blind, is that right? Then integrity by statement would mean that what's created exactly like God, which means when they became awake or came into consciousness, they had spiritual eyes. They could see everything God saw. So in other words, today right now, for instance, right now, in this building, there are angels who are with us. But unfortunately, we cannot, we cannot, uh, we cannot what? We cannot leverage that presence to its highest level because we can see them. We can feel them. And in a little bit of times, by the special grace of God, we get to see them and go, oh my, wow. And all the fear lives, you realize the witch next door, she's the one in trouble because the angel behind you can just wear a snap of his finger, he can break her neck like that. But before you were shaking when you saw, when you saw was a woman with witchcraft, she's next, standing next to you. What you don't see is Michael behind you saying, I'm going to kill her if she touches you. Are you catching what I'm saying? So when Satan comes in the garden, I want to I wanna, I wanna present to you that there was something he was looking for. Why would he go for the serpent? The serpent was given shrewdness. What is shrewdness? Shrewdness is the ability to hide your real motivation in when you are coming to the table of negotiation. The best negotiator, the best people can come in a meeting and make you fight over what they don't want. And when they have raised enough emotion around what they don't want, then they say, okay, you know what? Since you have argued so much on this thing, why don't you just give me 5% equity in that company? That's what they were after all the time. 
They said, okay, I'll give you that. And they laugh. You, you, oh, I got the deal. He said, no, I never wanted that deal. It was that what I wanted. But because I'm shrewd, you could not see me coming. <laughs> he needed a creature already gifted enough to hide his real agenda by its very making. And the serpent was given that divine design. It was shrewd. If people can see you coming, you're not shrewd. So he went and took advantage of what was already built, what was by design a gift of God to the serpent. We find that the serpent was talking to the woman, is right? How many know if a snake right now talked to you, how many of you will be sitting right there? You'll be jumping and prophesying in the air. You'll, be, you'll, you'll discover that you're an acrobat. Talk to me, somebody. Amen? Just by the adrenaline that will come through your You'll be like, hallelujah, come on, somebody. <laughs> we'll be catching you from the air. What happened? A snake just talked to me. Why was Eve not frightened? Because the human response would be this. If a snake speaks to you, Hello, Susie. You're not going to say, oh, that's cute. The, the cobra called me Susie. No, you are freaking out. Because in your frame of reference, snakes don't talk to people. Why is Eve not bothered by the talking serpent? Because, it, because serpents, the serpent in the garden is different from the serpent you know today. The serpent you know today is a symbol of judgment. The serpent of glory could speak. Talk to me, somebody. I got you what I'm saying. The serpent, what? Could speak. Is that right? That's why for Eve, this was not unusual. If it was unusual, our reaction would have been different. So watch this. The rabbi say, rabbi said, and now, now this is even proven in, in Judeo studies. They know that the serpent of old used to speak. It had the ability for speech of all the creatures. Of all the creatures. Come on, somebody. Now watch this. I saw he, he borrowed the body because a member by the law of dominion, spirits without bodies are illegal on earth. So Satan had to borrow something with the body. And the serpent had the body. And now he, he inhabited the serpent. The judgment of the serpent from the Lord was, why would you borrow your body to Satan so that he could deceive my daughter? From today, I'm cutting off your legs. By the way, the serpents of the Bible used to have legs. Now scientists have found two legs on every skin of a serpent today. Meaning that there was once legs on the serpent. And isn't the Bible amazing? You know, and so watch this. But I want to show you what, what did he come in the garden for? Because whatever he came in the garden for is what is, 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 the, is the number one reason he keeps coming to your garden of destiny. And if you're not shrewd enough to understand what he's really looking after, talk to me somebody, Amen. You are going to keep giving him your lunch because you're going to keep giving him your lunch. You know, because you are so focused, amen, on the orange, you don't see what he really wanted was this. Amen? So watch what happens here. And let's go through it very quickly. Thank you, Jesus. Is this a good conversation for the morning? Amen? Talk to me, somebody. And the woman said to the, uh, uh, so, so, the, so he said to the woman, has God's you know, so watch this. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, that word he said, that Satan in the snake, speaking to the woman. So there was a he inside the snake. And he said to the woman, God has indeed said, shall you not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, watch this, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it. Now shall you touch it, lest you die. Okay? And then the serpent said to the woman, watch this now. Surely you will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Your eyes will be open. And you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. So literally... He starts the conversation about the eating of the tree, but what is really after is opening their eyes. Now the question comes to mind. If Satan is after opening their eyes, were they blind? Because usually you can be, well, why, what is, if Satan is offering them the opening of their eyes, the question remains, were they blind? And in my study I found out something. That Adam and Eve 
in the order of creation, when they were in glory, before they fell, they were physically blind. The reason they were physically blind is because their physical eyes was a plan B status. God never intended for them to use their physical eyes because why do you need physical eyes when you can see like God? So in, you know, every, every programmer knows to build a default system in a program. And if this fails, this system, when this protocol is opened up, that means the original system has failed. So God never wanted them to see with the eyes you see with now. Because he understood the curse that would come with, your phys- with the curious case, your physical eyes. God knew that there are issues now of understanding. The energy of understanding. The energy of communication is going to slow down. Because now, what your spiritual eyes accept as a spiritual reality and can begin to move in that direction, your eyes in the natural will question for five years before they believe. So Satan was looking down to slow down the technology of engagement between the scalpel and the divine. Satan understood for I am an, a, 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 as a spirit who wants to take over their world because I've been cast out, out of heaven. I am at a tactical advantage if they retain the eyes that can see me coming. The eyes they had were eyes of dominion. So they could see what God saw. It's a reason they never had an issue with being naked. Because they were not naked. They were covered with Shekinah, glory. And the eyes they had could see glory. The eyes you now don't see glory. (laughs) So they could see Shekinah. So when the woman looked at herself, what did she see? A garment of glory. The same garment that will be returned to you when you get to heaven. Nobody's naked in heaven. They're just covered with different clothes. So they had garments of glory. That's why when they told God we are naked, God, oh my God, the default protocol is now in place. If you and tell me you are naked from a natural perspective, it means the product is malfunctioning already and it's already in a default status. And the default status is that of going through life using your physical eyes trying to judge spiritual things. Oh my God, what a problem this is. Because now the natural must become the adjudicator of the supernatural. Do you see the problem with that? Do you see the problem with that? You guys what I'm saying? So your spiritual eyes can look at your Naira bank account that says 1,000 Naira is all you've got, but your spiritual eyes can see a million dollars because that's in your, what in your profile in heaven. But not to convince your natural eyes to congruate, to convince your natural eyes to move from your Naira account to your heavenly account can take five years. And in between all kind of borrowing from people, by the time you get to what God has your blessing for you, you are using the blessing to pay off the people <laughs> that you borrowed money from because you couldn't wait on the Lord. And the reason why, you could, and, and the reason why it took long for God to manifest your million dollars in your heavenly account because it took him 20 years to get you to see the same thing. See, Satan was after, and I said, God, why the tree? Why is he after them eating the tree? And then God told me something. He said, because Satan knew something. He says, the, <laughs> the code, the code. See, I like to speak in programming language. Sometimes I spend too much time with programmers, okay? God said, mean, it's because the code, someone say the code. The code to unlock their spiritual eyes was in the tree. Have you noticed in technology that if you go to buy a software, sometimes, let's, let's, say, let's say those guys, because you are a filming church, so you, need, you probably use a lot of software that is for video production. Most uh, owners of that technology, you know what they do? They want you to have it. So they allow you to download it, but when you download it, there's a thing they send you later in an email called a licensing key. Is that right? If you have the technology on your computer, Amen? When you try to access it, it will be fighting for access key. The technology, the whole technology of the video production, editing, all the nuances of editing are already on your software, inaccessible until the license key is put in. God put the licensing key for the opening of the protocols of your natural eyes in the tree. 
They already had the physical eyes, but they were blind. They were functionally useless, unused, just unused. Why? Because God never ever intended for you to use them. But being a God of foreknowledge, knowing how hard-headed man can be, he built a default status. If you can't see me, at least I want you to see where your lamp is, where your handbag is. But the problem with that kind of sight is every time I begin to use a man, we may spend 10 years me asking the same woman, what do you see? I didn't have to ask that of Adam and Eve. Because in glory, they saw what I saw. So the speed of transaction was like that. So if I, you are driving around Lagos, and, I, and God says, that's your building. You say, thank you, Jesus. And because in that, the eyes they had were eyes of dominion. What they saw, their eyes possessed. In other words, the eyes they had do, were doing in the spirit what your hands do now. <laughs> their eyes were their hands. Whatever they saw, they possessed. By sight. But now it's not enough to see. It will take a while for you to hold it. <laughs> because the technology has slowed down. Amen. In internet, it will be like going from, it's like going from 5G. You remember dial up. Come on, some of you, I know. Are some of you older than, don't make me feel old. I can't be the only one who's old at Fountain of Life who understand the that when, when internet started. You remember that? The whole, the whole office would be around, the, around the, the code. Is this the code not coming in? Hold it, hold it. Because it was dial up and then you dial the phone. It was dial up. It was the lowest, freq- it was the lowest speed of what the internet. Broadband. Now we've got 5G. We've got, it's, it's super speed. Is that right? Versus dial up. You know what I'm saying? So Satan understood, I need. So, and then God showed me something that was very powerful. Somebody catching this? Take to your neighbor, what do you see? What do you really see? I came from a culture of lack. In 1989, when I got born again, I was so poor in my village, in the township I lived. Now, this is a township of poor people, okay? Ain't nobody rich in this township, I'm telling you. If you the very fact that you are living in that town is an indictment against your prosperity. But sometimes in the, in the kingdom of the blind, one man with a, a little bit of sight is a king. So I lived in a poor township. Amen. In my language, it's called Chimwemwe, which means joy. There was nothing to be joy about. I'm telling you. That's the truth. But they call it Chimwemwe. I was so poor. When poor people saw me, they got encouraged. They are like, my God, I thought I was doing bad until I saw this brother. God bless him, Jesus. Kuraba, Katoro, they begin to pray for you. What I'm saying is, in a culture like that, luck was built into the system. You fasted. And we had so many involuntary fasts. Not because we wanted to fast, because there was no food for the next three days. So to spiritualize the experience, we fasted. I found that when I made a fast, my brother, I would, the hunger strike was much better. Does that make sense? Because I made it spiritual. What I would do something with it. My point is, I did not know that the enemy was mentoring and conditioning my sight to see lack everywhere. So what do you think was the warfare God entered with me when he raised me? It had nothing to do with, with witches. Yeah, they were still there. But a bad dream sometimes, whatever. But to God, that is not as powerful as me changing how you see. Because if you keep seeing lack every time, knowing the dynamics of the spirit, you get more of the same. So watch what happens here. Is that the Bible, let me just finish it and I'm going to jump to two more scriptures. Are you enjoying this? This is easy morning, cool breeze kind of teaching. Is that all good? Is this good enough for you guys? Do you want more? <laughs> Okay, let's go through it. So, watch this. Knowing good and evil. Verse 6. So when the woman saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the food and ate it. 
She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. He, she gave to her husband with her, and what? He ate. This is where you are now. Open up what I call the curse of the curious case of the physical eyes. He ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. The eyes of what? Both of them were opened. Is that right? That means there was a, there was a short season when one had spiritual eyes, and the other one had entered the realm of physical eyes. The Lord taught me something in that that happens in marriage and it happens in ministry. He said to me, one of the, one of the cursors, the curse that comes with the, comes with the curious case of our physical eyes is this. That once we are in that state of where we are driven by our physical eyes, we have, a la- we have a lust and an appetite for everyone around us to see what we see. Because we begin to think they don't see what we see, they're not being reasonable. So in marriage, this is how it looks like. Your husband is seen by the eyes of faith. Yes, your Naira account, Mama, says you got a 10,000 Naira. That's not a lot of money. You're in trouble in the natural. So, but he's, he realizes if we stay in the natural, we are all sinking in the same toilet. But I'm in faith. Honey, don't worry, baby. God's going to provide. What kind of husband are you? You can't see what I see. In other words, the invitation is, I'm not going to let you go until you see what I see. Then, you know, then, then, and, and, and when you meet, I, I don't know what's wrong with my husband. He's always talking faith. I'm, I don't eat faith. I want to be practical. We've got to be real here. You know, and one day the husband healed. Yes, baby. Yeah, things are really bad. Yeah, we're only going to turn that on right on. Ah, now you can see. Oh, he cares. Well, he cares now, but both are now in the same territory where now you are victims of the curious case of your physical eyes. You know, because what you see is not the reality as things stand in heaven. The goal I'm trying to get to is this. I'm going to show you that in the realm of light, there is a level of elevation you're about to step into where blindness will be your greatest gift from God. And I'm going to show you as I come to the conclusion of this. But when the eyes are opened, already trouble begins. They can't even process because your physical eyes, you see those spiritual eyes not only could see, but they were perceptive in divine nature. That means if they saw a lion, their eyes told them this is a pet. When they change eyes, when you see a lion, you see yourself as lunch. And you begin to be afraid of what you dominated because your eyes are already telling you you are about to be eaten. So when you see the lion, before it even begins to run, you are finding a tree because you already are convinced I'm lunch. They, they live with lions and tigers every day and they saw them as pets because their eyes were eyes of dominion. They saw animals, they saw everything from God's perspective. And from God's perspective, hello Daniel, lions are not supposed to eat you. In your, from God's perspective, our lions are supposed to bow down and that's why lions survive, Daniel survived the lion's den. Talk to me somebody. Oh, hallelujah. What am I trying to say? I'm saying in this kingdom, there are people who are becoming blind again so they can see. <laughs> Talk to me, somebody. There are people in this kingdom that are becoming blind again. We need to become blind again. Because if Jesus is the last Adam and is a restorer of all things, if the original state of your physical eyes is that they were, not, they were, they were, they were decorative. Your eyes were decorative <laughs> in glory. Jesus, then, if he's the last Adam, must bring your eye, physical eyes to a decorative status. To allow you to enjoy how you look, but not determine how you see. <laughs> you can say, I look good, baby. Talk to me, somebody. Or, talk to me, somebody. Amen. But if you don't look good, you don't have the right suit on, you can still say, well, I don't like the suit. But that's where it ends, baby. Because I'm not going to let the suit define who I am. Because what I'm seeing, I'm seeing a future in which I own a bank in Nigeria. So my clothes are going to change because I see a bank that I'm going to own. So, hey, baby. My, my spiritual father, Miles Mono, used to say it this way. Eyes that look are common, but eyes that see are rare. Your eyes are supposed to become decorative in glory. How many want your eyes to become decorative? Decorative means they have no, they have, decorative means your eyes will no longer be invited to the table of negotiation with God. What am I talking about? Let me show you what, what, how, how powerful this thing is. Amen? Hey, well, let's turn you in your Bibles very quickly. 
Let's move away from this. Let's move away, move away from this. Very, very quickly, go to something Jesus said that I never understood until now. Now understand what Yeshua was talking about. I never understood. Okay? Matthew 13. Come on, fountain of life, church. Amen. Amen. Man, I love this church so much. I need some membership cards right now. Jimmy, I can, I can sign. I may be the fourth member traveling all over the world, but you know, I, want to, I just want to know. Come on, somebody. Amen. I'm serious. Genesis 13, verse 14. Are you there, saints? Are you there? Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the Lord is about to bless you with blindness. And I tell them, for there is a level in this kingdom. Said, for there is a level, said, said, tell your neighbor, for there is a level of light in this kingdom where blindness will be God's greatest gift to you. So now Jesus turns here. Matthew 13. Can I bring it home? Now I'm going to bring it home. Matthew 13 from verse 14. And in them, watch now, there's a prophecy concerning this. In them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. Okay? Hearing you hear. That means, Lord told me something. When their ear, we use what I'm like, the, you, the eyes and the ears were connected. By the way, when God said you shall die, God called the discovery of your physical eyes death. In the day you eat of it, you discover death. Why? Because God considers living life by what you see with your physical eyes death. That's death. That's why Lord chose Sodom, not knowing Sodom would be judged by fire, and you leave, you leave Sodom bankrupt and sleep with his daughter will be the end of his legacy. Do you, do you, know, do you honestly believe if, if Lord saw all of that with the eyes of the Spirit, he would have moved towards Sodom? Why did he move? The Bible says because Sodom at the time looked fatal. The curse of the curious case of your physical eyes, it will always lead you Talk to me, somebody. That's why. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. That's why. That's why God could be giving you a godly husband who's going to dominate Nigeria in the ministry space. But the first time he arrived to the front of life, he was like Francis Mouse. I arrived in church with one trouser, one T-shirt, and two shoes that were prophesying. At the time, if I'd proposed any of my sisters, they would have looked at me like this. They'd say, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. They would not know. They were saying no to Francis Mouse. They were saying, no, can you believe that? They were saying no to Francis Miles. Now I talk to governments. I do all kinds of things. I've got money coming through my ears. Don't be jealous. Just say thank you, Jesus. But I'm saying that many sisters looked at me and I was a, I was a, uh, they didn't see me as a potential suitor. They saw me as a prayer case. This is the curse this is the curse of the curious case of your physical eyes. That even when blessing enters your door, you will reject it because your physical eyes do not see this is how God can bless me. My God. I went to Harvard. Why am I working there? And God says, no. Because in three months, the owner is about to give you the company. Ah, no. I don't even like the salary scale. I don't whatever. Never asking, God, what are you, where are you in this? Because maybe what you never thought is the very thing that changes everything. Are you with me, somebody? So Jesus is saying this very quickly. He's saying this. He says, herein is the prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled. Hearing you, hearing you do not understand. Seeing you shall not perceive. Meaning their original eyes could see and perceive instantly. So uh, they are, they are, the spiritual eyes of dominion they had would look at a poor man and see a Joshua Selman five years. And then make a quality decisions in the now. Yes, I can see it. Do you know how many of you women would be married to powerful men if you could see that? How many of you men would be married to the right woman because you could see that? Talk to me somebody. But what do we go by? How does it look? 
Does he have uh, Louis Vuitton in his feet? What you don't know, that Louis Vuitton is the last Louis Vuitton you ever wear. <laughs> Actually, the man who's looking good when you meet him is on his way back. So you are marrying a train on the down road. And your physical eyes got you there while everything spirit is screaming, don't do it! Don't do it! He says, having eyes, you he said, best, best, best. for the hearts of these people are grown down. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes, they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes. What eyes is he talking about? The original eyes of dominion. Because the Lord spoke to me something, a mystery. He said, Francis, the, when, the way I designed you is I knew the day your physical eyes opened. Satan knew this. That the licensing key from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that opened and activated your spiritual eyes simultaneously closed your spiritual eyes because you couldn't have it both. So if Yeshua is the last Adam, he must reverse the cycle. He must make you blind so you can see again. He must make you blind so you can what? See again. <laughs> he says, watch what he says. He says, their eyes are closed. And then he says, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so I should heal them. And then he ends by saying, blessed are you who see. Blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for the ear. What, that part he was talking to his own disciples. Because you have come to me, it was a tree that mean, this, which was eating in a tree that caused their eyes to be closed and their original eyes to be closed and they defaulted to the lowest eyes a spirit can have, which is physical eyes. But I am the last tree. If you eat in me, I'll close your physical eyes. And the way you walk, people won't understand you. Because people say, can't you see? Can't you see? Can't you see you have no money? How can you not have money? Can't you see? The accountants won't even understand you. They'll say, but pastor, I don't understand. Why are, you, why are we building a new church? We've only got 100,000 naira. You see, because that's what they can see. But no longer can, but you are moving forward because you have now become blind again. So you can see only what God says. Now let me tell you how this looks like. How many know of a guy called Jesse Duplantis? Have you ever heard of a Jesse Duplantis? Jesse? From, okay. Pa Jesse Duplantis lives in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Got a great ministry out of there. And Jesse was coming from a, a trip somewhere within Louisiana. And he said he drove through New Orleans. Now he doesn't live in New Orleans. He, he was going on his way to Baton Rouge. And as he's driving, he passed through a very rough neighborhood. Rough, what we in America we call the hood, okay? You know, when, when you, you know, listen, when you see the hood in America, I don't care where you're coming from. If you're coming from Africa, from as well, you don't want to live in the hood, okay? It's a, a infested with po poverty is a configuration of the hood plus violence and all that kind of stuff. So he passed, because it was a shortcut, they passed with his driver. And then he saw this dilapidated, massive warehouse building. It looked so awkward, so bad. In a town, he has nothing to do with. But if you know Baton Rouge, the different suburb, he has ministry there. He flies, with, he flies in and out. He just happened to be driving this time, and he drove through New Orleans. Said, I, and Jesse says, as I was driving by this bad, better building, I heard the Lord said, Jesse? Say, yes, Lord. Buy it. That's your building. Now, do you know what your curse of the physical eyes mean of us? I said, what? I ain't buying that thing. Look, look at that thing. Lord, and on top of that, Lord, I don't even live here. This is the hood. And it's, 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 it's ugly. It's dusty. You can see what's around it. Jesse just called his, 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 his accountant. On the crying guy said, hello. He told her, he told her, I found a big building. It's still up there. You get it for almost nothing. He said, God told me when I was passing by, it's my building. You buy it right away. I don't care what it costs. Just buy it. It's going to be negotiate. Buy it. The accountants, they looked for it. They went and bought it for cheap. Because who wanted a building that bad in the hood? And they brought the titles to Jesse. Said, Jesse, this is the bad. Man, it's bad. It's a bad. Oh, God, it's bad. But hey, you said God told you. Here are the titles. 
you are now the beautiful owner of a bad building in the hood. He said, yeah, no, Jesus gave it me. He said, Jesse took the, the titles, put them in his um, glove compartment, or um, uh, put them in a tray of his office, never looked them again. Until five years later, a phone call came from the office of the mayor of New Orleans. Hello, Jesse, we, 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 we've been looking at title. We did the title search. We found out you own a building in New Orleans in this part of town. Uh, can we talk? And Jesse said, oh, I began to get excited. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. That's what you told me. Talk to me now. He said, what do you, he says, well, so he told his people, find out what they're about to do. So they found out, you know, Jesse said, I was going to make, I was, I was not going to deal quickly. Because when the mayor is calling you, they're, they're up to something big. And don't negotiate before you know what they're trying to do. So he had his people investigate, and the city of New Orleans was about to do a multi-million dollar uh, um, renovation of that area, and there was going to be things passing through there. When he saw the plans and realized the value of the plans to the city, he said, now they can call me. Yeah, I, I own that building. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? He ended up selling the building for, for, at least, for I think, three uh, three. Point five to four million dollars. I think he picked up for less than hundred thousand dollars. He never lived in it, but made over three million dollars profit on a building in a bad part of town. Because blessed are you who see, blessed are you who can hear. This I'm finding now is a challenge of destiny for all of us. Turn to your neighbor and say, what do you see? And tell them, is what you are seeing lifting you up? Or keeping you in the same place? Stand up everyone, we're going to pray for you. Did you receive that? Did you receive that, people? Fountain of church, life church. <laughs> I can tell you, my biggest battle with God has been over what do you see. Very rarely does God ever argue with me about theology. He, I, our fight is about the what do you see. What do you see? I'll give you a testimony. If Brother Jim will allow me to have two minutes. Two, five minutes. Just increased. When you see that kind of grace, you, you increase your limit to five minutes. People have always asked me, Donna Miles, how did you end up where you are now? Because it's amazing what the Lord has done with my ministry in America. Dr. Kunle knows. You know, for some people, America is a place where they go and get a new life and pay some bills and things change. And I appreciate that. But I'm a changer. I'm a global changer. Putting food on the table, if that's all America is for me, it's death to me. I'm a changer. I'm a changer of nations. That's what I, it's what I saw. It's what God promised me. So, but here's how it came. I'm talking about the curse of the curious case of your physical eyes. <laughs> Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, I wish you were blind. Because if you are blind, then I would heal you. But since you claim to see, your sins are now with you. He told them that. That's a judgment. He says, I wish you were blind. What was he saying? There is a level of light where blindness is a blessing to you. As a matter of fact, let me just say this very quickly in a, in a, in a minute. In John chapter 9, go home and study it. Jesus passes by and sees a blind man. And there's something unique about this blind man because healing the blind was not unique to Jesus. Blind eyed open every day. There was only one blind man Jesus opened where the word glory was attached to his blindness. For every blind person, blindness was there. Black, black blindness was a handicap within their physical condition. So in that economy, if you're blind physically, you are useless in many things. So it was mercy for God to heal their blind eyes. So the disciples got used to blindness being a handicap. Couldn't they? they got used to blindness being a curse, a handicap. So one day they see this blind man. And they ask Jesus a theological question based upon your experience. They said, Lord, who sinned? This man or his parents. Because in their eyes, if he's blind, he's cursed. Somebody committed a serious inequity. And Jesus surprises them with only this, with this one blind man. He said, no, 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 no. 
<laughs> this is my favorite blind man. Because it's my prophecy to a generation that thinks they can see but are blind. So his blindness is a gift to his generation. So he says, no, this one, his blindness has nothing to do with the curse. His mother didn't sin, neither did he sin. But his blindness is for the glory of God. How can blindness for the glory? He's thinking that there's a level where blindness works to the glory of God. So they brought the blind man and he heals them. And he tells them, go and wash your eyes in a pool of Siloam. He goes to wash it. He's the only one he healed this way. And Siloam means sent one. What he's saying is go, but when your eyes open, it's not your physical eyes that are just opening. They just say it will be a testament because the Siloam means sent. I'm going to give you the eyes of anyone I'm sending. If anyone I'm sending to a generation doesn't see like you see, they are a lost cause in kingdom advancement. The moment his eyes open, you know, now you know, the moment he's open, open, the moment he's the only blind man that is, is the moment his eyes open, the Lord put him in the middle of the Sanhedrin council to argue theology. How does it, he ends, they bring him, they say, okay, we see you're blind. Who made you, if you look at that story, the next 20 scriptures is the blind man arguing with scholars. And the more he argued, the more he proves the scholars were the blindest in the society. They said, who opened your eyes? He said, Jesus. No, we know he's a sinner. We said, I don't know if he's a sinner. Oh, I know. He opened his eyes. Then he began to talk. Said, oh, guys, you guys seem interested. Are you trying to be his disciples? Now he's trying to do He said, no, no, no. We can't be his disciples. We're disciples of Moses. So the more they speak, the more they indict themselves. The blind man could see Jesus. The scholars who led Torah every day couldn't see Messiah right in front of them. I believe God is about to do something. God is about to make you blind again. What do I mean? Amen? Everything supernatural. Men who are doing big things. If they told you their story, they did it with having to shut their physical eyes every day because everything around them told them this can be done. Ask the Morris Soluros, talk to me somebody. Ask these guys. Ask Baba. If, if I'm telling you I don't have to be there. You know, in January, I had the privilege of spending 25 minutes in his office with Baba David Oyedepo. You know, and he told me something. My son, everybody thinks meeting me is all it takes. But you know, my son, the secrets of the fathers are in their writings. Eat my writings. Eat my writings. I love them. I ate Kenneth Copeland. I ate Till Osborne. Until you have begun to see what nobody else can see. Sense. You don't build Canaan land three hours out of Lagos in a bush and build such a city because your natural eyes encourage you to do so. At some level, he became blind. He became blind to the advice of elders who use eyes to judge ministry. This is the dilemma of people of ministry like Jimmy who have been called to craft a new day but they're surrounded by people who have the curious case of their physical eyes. And what is what happened? And what do I mean, Dr. Miles? Elijah and Elisha are walking. Elisha is about to go. A transition of mantles is about to happen. Talk to me, somebody. I got you what I'm saying. Watching at the distance at the disciples, not of Elisha, but of Elijah. So their, their sight has been conditioned to the era of Elijah. Because even when you are spiritual, your eyes get conditioned to a certain level of ambience of ministry and success. But at the moment of transition, you need the gift of blindness or you won't follow the next Elisha. So what happens now is Elijah is all the sons of the prophets have known. They know his anointing. They know how he, what he does. But Elijah himself knows my era has come to an end. I'm about to hand my mantle to Elisha. And they are walking together. So he's testing Elisha at every point. At Gilgal, at Jericho, he tells him, leave me. Because he wants to see the level of attachment the man has to the mantle. The guy says, as my soul liveth, while you are still alive, I'm not going to let you on my side. They kept going. Finally, he passed every test. 
Because every mantle has a character. Oh my God. Every mantle has a character a, a, a requirement. Every mantle, whatever. And all of a sudden, don't think Jimmy Odukoya is on the pulpit because he is the, the son of your founder. The devil is a liar. God does not transfer mantles based on family ties. God transfers mantles based on family, on revelation. The only economy of glory is revelation. So finally they get to the place coolly where the mantle must pass. Where the mantle must pass. And the father turns to the son. Elisha, I can fear the chariots coming. I can hear the chariots coming. What must I now do for you, seeing you are the next level of my ministry? And now, uh, he says this, I want a double portion of your spirit. Not your anointing. We always read that wrong. Because the young men came to understand that there was something about the spirit of the father this God respected. If I can have a double of that, then it goes without saying that his anointing would double. Because of a double of the same spirit, God has been honoring. I want the double portion of your spirit. Because when I go back to my generation, I don't want to give them another spirit. My administration will be different. The nuances of my means will be different. But it will be the same water they have been drinking at a double level. Because it's your spirit I'm asking for. So, Elijah turned around and he must have smiled. Like every mentor knows, my ministry is safe. Its legacy will be a double portion, not, not going down. And he said, but here's a problem. At the moment of transfer, I don't have, I'm not the final signature. Because the spirit, the God who gave me this mantle, has a final test. He says, if you see me. Because he must ask you the Jeremiah question. What do you see? If you see me going. Then the one who, 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 who operates with men at the level of seeing. Who now gave you the mantle. Because if you. So now Elisha's final test has nothing to do with Elijah, it has everything to do with God and him. That's why when the chariots came, the Bible says, Elisha saw them and he screamed, my father, the chariots of Israel. Watch this. And the Bible says, at the moment of sight, the mantle fell because in the, in the eyes they had before they fell, eyes were for possession. What you saw, you heard. When he saw, the mantle fell on him. Now here is a dilemma of ministry. When he, Elijah lives, here's what you don't see. That the prophets were just 100 meters away. And they never saw the chariot. The school of the prophets, which in reality were the custodian of the Elijah ministry, never saw what Elijah saw. That means they failed the test of sight so they could not appreciate the transition that had just happened and, they, and it's proven when Elisha comes back he tries to demonstrate he gets to the water jug he says where is the God of Elijah he hits the mantle it parts now you will understand he's trying to show them if the mantle of Elijah is with Elisha there is no way Elijah is still in town No two people can occupy the same mantle at the same time. So it crosses over. But what do the elders, the board of the Elijah ministry has taken over, said to him, they don't, they said to him, Elisha, you went with our father. You came back alone. And yes, he said, yes, because the child of Israel, I've taken my father and the mantle is on me. They don't say, amen. No. 
They said, do you want us to go and look everywhere? Lest the Spirit of God has dropped them in a different geography. So the ministry of Elisha is delayed, is delayed from starting because he had to wait for those with physical eyes in ministry to authenticate that he can move on. Notice there now that Elijah sits there frustrated because he understands that mantle is gone. A new mantle has arrived. It's on me but in a different ambience because I've got double of what he had. Something is happening with me. I just showed you I can do what he used to do. But, but, but to honor the past, I'm going to sit around and wait for you. Go on a useless physical search for the man the heavens have taken. And the Bible says all the prophets went in all four corners of the earth looking for the man heaven had received. This is the curse of the physical earth. Every visionary has to fight the people around them because they can't see the next level. Maybe they saw the first level. The problem of sight is God does not judge your sight for one level. At every transition of season, your eyes will be checked again because your, what you saw yesterday can become an enemy of the next thing that's coming. So if you are blind, it doesn't mind that you are awake when Fountain of Life started. Are you awake to the next level of the ministry? Because if you're not awake to that, you become its biggest problem because you say, I don't see it. You keep saying, I don't see it. I don't see it. We used to, I don't see it. And God said, that is the problem. Because you are now using the physical eyes and the curse that comes with them. And the curse of the physical eyes is, is, is slowing down divine energy for the comfortability of the flesh. Let's slow it down. We don't have to be fast because I don't see it. And until I see it, this was the curious case of an, an apostle who saw miracles, signs, and wonders. So Jesus raised Lazarus, but when Jesus who raised Lazarus was told to him that the man who raised a dead man after four days has himself risen, he says, I won't believe it until I touch his hands. I won't believe it. Until he comes to me and presents himself. And Jesus, out of mercy, appeared to John, to Thomas. He said, Thomas, come and touch me. But if you are touching me, the frequency of your apostleship is so low, I can't use you in changing nations. Because if every time you have to check the divine with the natural to verify it, at that level of speed, I'll do nothing with your life. For blessed is he who believes, ah, before they can see. Pray in tongues. Ask God to let you see. Ask the Lord to open your eyes to the next season of Fountain of Life. Come on. Pray for yourself. Say, God, I want to be an asset. Tell God, I want to be an asset. I want to be an asset to Elisha. Lord, I want to be an asset to Elisha. I was here well, 32 years ago when Elijah began the ministry. But I'm here for Elisha, Lord. Open my eyes that I can help Elisha. Open my eyes that I can be useful in the days of Elisha. In the name of, come on, pray right now. Ask God to make you useful in the days of Elisha. Yes, you are God. God honors your sacrifice in the days of Elijah. But he says, I am the God of Elisha as well. Would you enter with me into a new season where we'll do things fountain of life has never done. In the name of Jesus. But it's the same spirit. It's the same water at a different frequency, at a different energy, at a different ambience. Can you see it? In the name of Jesus. Come on, pray. You are praying for yourself. You are praying to be repositioned. Ask the Lord to reposition you for a new fountain of life church. In the name of Jesus. God will want to use you like he used you for 32 years. He want to use you like that for the next 32 years. Following an Elisha who's going to see double the miracles. Double the miracles of Elijah. God is having you follow an Elisha who do double, who do double. Because you see the Elisha is building from the shoulders of Elijah and upwards. So he's going to be double. He's going to see at elevation the Elijahs cannot see. Because when you are standing on the shoulders of a father, you see further than the father. But at the father not reason, you don't see the way you see. But now join him at a higher form of revelation, at a higher form of sight. See, talk to me somebody. So when people ask you, 
Why is Elisha doing what he's doing? And you tell baby, just go and wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam and you are going to see what Jimmy is doing. Just go and wash your eyes. Have Jesus wash your eyes and the blindness to the new season will disappear and you will see that fountain of life has moved to a whole new level. New level. Double your giving. Double your commitment. Because the era of double portion requires double, double of everything. Double your tithing. Double your giving. Double your commitment. Double your engagement. It's a new season of Elisha in the house. Lebo marimu. Lende marimu sakariana babie. Yele bekonto. Shalamando robosiki. Oh, Rabba Kata Rabba. Let's pray for all our brothers and sisters who are going to join us tonight, who are not part, who are part of Fountain of Life. Pray for the same anointing. And even while they are at work, God will be sending all of them to the pool of Siloam so they can see with new eyes of a new Elisha. They can come and re-engage like never before. They'll come and run like never before. In the name of Jesus. Ikarabamando robosata. Yeah, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Mm. I believe in activation. I'll end with this and give up the mic. Say, Heavenly Father, righteous judge, I gave you the permission. Judge my eyes to the degree that I'm blind to what you are doing with Elisha. Help me to see. I don't want to be one of the sons of the prophets. Loyal to Elijah, but cannot say that a new era has begun that will sustain the legacy of Elijah while moving forward to greater heights. Open my eyes. Give me the gift of blindness to natural things that are trying to steal my attention and my commitment to the vision. Make me blind to those things that I can only see what you are doing in the house. The new things you are doing in the house. The former things have come and gone. But a new day is upon us. And I don't want to be irrelevant in a new season. Give me the language of this new era. The hearing ears of this new era. The seeing eyes of this new era that I may be a gift to this house for another 32 years should the Lord tarry. I want to be a gift to strengthening this church to become bigger and better in the name of Jesus. Lighting behind the vision, the nuances, the personality of Elisha in the name of Jesus. God, I give you praise. Thank you, Lord. In my own journey, I ask you, God, make me blind to everything Satan has sent to bewitch me from success. Blind me. Blind me from satanic evidences. And give me the gift of blindness to those things. That like, that, 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 like young Jeremiah, I want to say what you see about my life. That you may perform your word concerning me and my generation. In Jesus' name. Give God a shout. Still doing it. Still doing it. Still doing it.